everybody and welcome to this food season event solutions for a food system in crisis it's wonderful to have you all here it's also wonderful to welcome people who are following us live online um, and it's just so great it's great to have the online people but it's just amazing to have people in real life as well so this is really exciting Yay. Uh, we're in the fifth year of the food season my name is Polly Russell I'm the founder and the curator of the food season working with guest directors Angela Clutton and and Melissa Thompson. Uh, food, you will know food is the best subject, that's because you're here, and tonight we're going to hear also that food is the most important subject, the most urgent subject. The food season every year tries to explore all aspects of food, uh, often showcasing the British Library's collections. So far this year, over six weeks at the season runs, we've done food in prisons, food in literature, African-American foodways, and coming up, we've got on Monday, the legend uh, chef Ainsley Harriet, another leg legendary chef on Wednesday, um, beamed in from California, Alice Waters, talking about her slow food manifesto, so very relevant in a way to this evening's event uh, and then on the 18th of May we've got Eliza Acton and Mrs Beaton going uh, up for a face-off to decide finally which one is the best. Um, that All of those are coming up in the next week but there's many more events going all the way through um, May. Uh, the food season is sponsored by KitchenAid so we very much want to thank them for their support. So for tonight's event, which we'll get to very quickly, uh, there's going to be an hour of panel discussion and then half an hour of audience questions. So do start thinking about your questions now. We've got the most extraordinary panel here. It is a complete privilege and pleasure to have them. Uh, B is going to introduce all the speakers and I'm going to very quickly introduce uh, B. So B Wilson is a food writer, a campaigner, and without doubt one of the most vital and important voices in food, uh, and I would say in the world. Uh, she writes for the London Review. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. She writes for the London Review of Books, for The Guardian, for The Wall Street Journal, amongst other things. It's really hard to um, describe her writing because she has so much breadth and expertise. She draws on history, on politics, on geography, on culture, and of course on food and cookery. Uh, her books are lively and engaging. Uh, she's the author of seven books. She's won numerous awards. I highly recommend all her books, especially First Bite and The Way We Eat Now, both of, both of which are essential and also just incredibly readable. Uh, she's also very involved with a fantastic charity called Taste Ed around education in schools. She is the perfect chair for this evening. So, B. Wilson and our panel, thank you. Thank you. That was much, much too generous. Thank you. So, I'm so delighted to welcome you all to this, um, both the audience here in person, and I've gathered there are actually 150 people joining us, not in the room, which is always quite an amazing thought, thinking actually there are twice as many people as we can see here. Um, the latest talk in the British Library food season 2022. The subject under discussion is solutions for a food system in crisis. It's a daunting, some would say terrifying subject, and one which has become still more so with the war in Ukraine exacerbating and highlighting so many of the pre-existing fragilities about the world's supply chains, with huge rises already in the price of wheat and sunflower oil contributing to the crisis in the cost of living. One of the big questions we'll be asking is whether a crisis of this magnitude can lead to the transformative changes in the food system that are so desperately needed. And I can't think of anyone better placed to answer these questions than these four people here, and I'm going to introduce them in turn. First, I'm completely honoured to introduce Francis Moore Lappe. Is it Francis or Frankie? You just signed an email, Frankie. Frankie is... Fine. Frankie. I like Frankie. Frankie. I, it's amazing. I kind of can't think of you as anything other than Francis Morlappe, but okay. Francis Morlappe, aka Frankie, whose Diet for a Small Planet, first published astonishingly in 1971, is one of the most influential and galvanizing food books ever written. It was reissued last year in its 50th edition. If you haven't already read it, there is no better time. I mean, it's just scintillating. Even if you think you know all about this subject, she writes with such immediacy and urgency. 
that it just seizes you and you want to go away and eat differently immediately. It makes you want to change your breakfast and change the world. Um, she has said that she was first shocked into action as a young woman by the spectacle of hunger in the midst of plenty. It sold close to two million copies in half a dozen languages. And it was hugely ahead of its time in pointing out some of the vast contradictions in the American way of eating, which has become the way of eating of so many other countries in the world now in the subsequent 50 years. I mean, you didn't know that. The sad thing is it was so prescient and so many things went in the, the same direction that you were describing as being wrong then. For example, why did Americans produce so much grain to feed animals when it would have been so much more efficient to eat the grain direct? Why did people obsess about getting enough protein when their diets already contain too much? And why, when no one actively chooses to be sickened by what they eat, does so much of what is for sale as food do just that? But it's also a deeply hopeful and practical book, one with lovely recipes, and, I, and the new edition has a whole new set of recipes from lots of the best chefs in America and beyond. And I wanted to start by quoting a whole paragraph from it, because there is something that Frankie says in a chapter called Recipe for a Personal Revolution, which I think sets a tone of optimism for tonight, which I hope we will keep returning to over the next hour and a half. I should also have said we will chat among ourselves for an hour and then open it to audience questions after an hour. Um, and I hope we'll keep coming back to this optimism, even as we are looking with clear eyes at the sheer, often bleak seeming scale of the problems facing us. She writes, mammoth social problems, especially global ones like world hunger and ecological destruction paralyze us. Their roots seem so deep, their ramifications endless. So we feel powerless. How can we do anything? Don't we just have to leave these problems to the experts? We try to block out the bad news and hope against hope that somewhere, someone who knows more than we do has some answers. The tragedy is that this totally understandable feeling that we just leave big problems to the experts lies at the very root of our predicament because the experts are those with the greatest stake in the status quo. The solutions can only come from people who are less locked in, people like you and me. Where do we begin when everything seems to touch everything else? Food, I discovered, was just the tool I needed to crack the seemingly impenetrable facade. What we eat is within our control, yet the act tied us, ties us to the economic, political and ecological order of our whole planet. So I hope I'm going to ask you and some of the questions to elucidate and expand on that. Our next speaker is Henry Dimbleby who will be known by many of you in the room as the co-founder of the Leon chain of restaurants. But he's also, among many, many other roles, most relevantly for tonight, the lead behind the National Food Strategy, which is another thing I urge you to read. It's free, you can download it. Just the graphs alone are absolutely eye-opening. It's an amazing piece of work. It was published in two parts, and most of the food policy experts I've spoken to see it as the greatest chance for a meaningful change in British food policy in a generation or more. A hugely ambitious report, it sets out a series of recommendations to align the food we eat better, both with human health and the needs of the planet. And Henry is also one of the co-founders of Chefs in Schools, which is a wonderful charity which trains chefs to transform the food served in school kitchens, and which is another example of positive, hopeful change in action. Next, we have Neil Ward. Neil is a professor of human geographer, geography, sorry, specialising in agri-food and rural development at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. He was the university's deputy vice-chancellor, and he's the author of a really fascinating book that's coming out this summer. It's published by Routledge. It's called Net Zero, Food and Farming. And it has a look at what policies it would actually take to get Britain to net zero in agriculture, but also why the historic path that British food policy has taken isn't going to be what we need to get us to the next stage. And crucially, what I'm hoping Neil will bring to the discussion is some deeply needed historical context for the ways in which the very imperfect food system that we've now inherited 
was largely set up after the war by people with good intentions who felt that producing ever greater volumes of food without really considering the quality was the urgent priority, but also that things don't have to be this way. So when people think that the kind of food that we have is just a kind of act of nature or of God and we just need to leave it to the market, they're missing the many, many ways in which our food environment is something that has been shaped by countless human decisions. And finally, I'm delighted to welcome Tom Hunt, who's an award-winning chef, food educator, writer, climate change activist, and the author of a fantastic cookbook called Eating for Pleasure, People and the Planet. You may have read some of Tom's brilliant articles on food waste and how to salvage deliciousness from leftovers in The Guardian. And he has an ethos which he describes in his book, Eating for Pleasure, as root to fruit eating. And I'm hoping we're gonna be hearing a lot more about that in the solutions. So introduction over, I think we need to start the discussion. Tonight, as I've said, is build as solutions to a food system in crisis. But I think we need to start by doing some work to define the crisis, um, both for humans and for the planet. So I wanted to start with Frankie. What is the food crisis? Well, I will begin with the, the observation that began, uh, you so kindly told my beginning when I was so shocked as a young, young woman and we were told that we'd run out of food in the world and then, wait a minute, I realized when I went to the Berkeley Library and checked out the numbers that in fact, uh, we were creating scarcity out of plenty because uh, the meat-centered, particularly the meat-centered diet that used such vast quantities uh, to create so little. And even today, 80% of our agricultural land is used to grow livestock that provide us only 18% of our calories. So that was my beginning. And um, as I've peeled away the layers, <laughs> I've, uh, I'd like to start with an even <laughs> bigger observation that we human beings don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. We see through culturally determined frames. So I, I've started saying that for humans, it's not seeing, it's believing. It's believing is seeing. And my work now is very much about what is the frame, the limiting frame that keeps us from seeing solutions. And I'm so glad we are focusing on solutions. And certainly here in the United States, still the idea that we have a free market, <laughs> that it channels resources in ways that serve us all and the better competitors win in this free market, that that still has such a grip that we cannot see the vast waste built into our food system, the va vast hunger that is totally needless, and now biodiversity and increased climate risk from agriculture. So I, I just wanna begin with that, that notion that we, we must go deep to the underlying assumptions that keep people from understanding what the real problem is. And so that's really, um, led my life, led me, and in all my remarks I'm going to be sharing today, uh, hopefully not repeating myself too much about this theme, but that um, beneath um, the scarcity of, of healthy food and healthy diets um, that so many people suffer from is a scarcity of democracy. And so I've come to understand democracy as not simply a structure of government, but as a way of life, as a way of life in which we we grow from the classroom, from the home on to knowing that we have a voice that counts. And in our, I'm speaking now as a US citizen and we're one of the most flawed democracies um, where private interests have come to control, come to influence, come to warp our public decision-making. So we now have about a thousand agribusiness lobbyists who <laughs> uh, influence policy in Washington corporate donations that have such influence in our system, and particularly in agriculture. So that is, is uh, you know, what I want to share. And I want later on to talk about where I see people actually creating a participatory form of dispersion of power, of transparency, and a culture of mutual, mutual accountability, which for me is the definition of democracy. So. 
definition of the crisis, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I completely agree. I, only to add that it is another thing that is the problem is that most people don't recognise how big a problem the food system is. And just to kind of frame that, in terms of the environment, it is by far, by a country mile, the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse. It is by far the biggest cause of freshwater scarcity and freshwater pollution. It is by far the biggest cause of deforestation. It is, along with energy, one of the two major causes of climate change. It, um, it produces 20 to 30% of our global emissions. Uh, and on the health front, it is now by far the biggest cause of avoidable disease. In the NHS in this country, uh, the estimate is that by 2035, type 2 diabetes alone, which is only one disease that is caused by food, is going to cost us more than all treating all cancers put together. And if you think about the human misery of those suffering, of their carers that sits behind that, it is just impossible to overstate how big the problem is. The second thing I would say is to your point about Neil and, and the, 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 you know, how we got here is it is worth remembering that it really was a miracle, our food system. So after the Second World War... In the were, report you say that yeah, it is a miracle, it's a miracle and a disaster. It's a miracle and a That's disaster, first, yeah. So after things. the Second World War, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. Up until that point in history, pretty much, when we'd increased our population, we'd dug up more land, we'd you know, ripped out forest and, and turned it into farmland. Scientists projected that we would be 9 billion people by 2050. They were broadly right. There was literally no way that we were going to be able to, with current methods and current diets, feed the whole planet. And so the Green Revolution, which involved the creation of short-stemmed, high-yielding wheat, uh, chemicals, nitrogen and pesticides, and modern irrigation techniques, meant that we fed that huge increase of people from the same amount of land. We now produce 1.7 uh, times calories per person in the world than we did back then. But in doing that, as is so often the case, we inadvertently, because we got the measurements wrong, uh, created something that is destroying the environment and destroying our health. And I do think, I am optimistic, that if we actually focus on the right things, then there is no reason that human ingenuity cannot be put, play out in such a way that you solve those two problems as well. We'll get to that in a moment. But Neil, the crisis, continue on the crisis. I mean, so what Henry's just said about... Can you talk to us a bit more about the extent to which um, the post-war completely understandable focus on hunger got us here in some ways? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, you know, one, one feature of the crisis is that lots of society's problems are kind of reflected in the food system. Um, and actually the food system itself drives quite a lot of the problems as well. And those connections aren't, aren't really made. So the, in the, in the current sort of political environment, the, there's not the profile given to the food system and food politics that perhaps there, mm. there should be. Um, and, and I wonder whether the climate crisis and the net zero commitment is going to mean that over the next five to ten years, there will have to be that opening up of that political debate in a way that there hasn't really been in recent years. Uh, I, I think... Um, the, the, the thing that motivated me to, to, to work on my book was I'd spent quite a lot of time way back thinking about the history of agricultural policy and the evolution of the food system and the pivotal moment at, at the end of the Second World War uh, when the Agriculture Act was, 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 um, was agreed. And we, we set off on a path which, which was a revolutionary path and productivity was completely transformed in the UK. And, and the, word you, the broad word you give to that set of policies is productivism. Yeah. And you contrast this with previous 70 years of British food policy, which have been largely laissez-faire. Yes, um, after the Corn Laws were repealed, um, so 1850s through to the First World War, and actually beyond that, up to the Second World War, really, we had an empire, in, uh, and there was a sense that you just bought food in from where it could be produced as cheaply as possible. So it was quite a globalised kind of food system, and there was no support for British agriculture at all. It was really poor dog and stick farming. It was um, uh, there wasn't much money to be made in it. I mean, it was impoverished countryside, and and the Second World War was a crisis which just catalysed a whole new direction, which was we should produce as much food as possible in the UK 
for balance of payments purposes and because we had a dollar crisis in 1945-46. Um, so there was a need to try and reduce the reliance on imports from elsewhere. But that led to particular technologies being really heavily supported and adopted. It was the adoption of an American model, actually. A lot of the technologies had been developed prior to the Second World War and were already taking off in the US. And Britain sort of signed up to an American style of evolution of the food system. And it was hugely successful in its own terms. But it was only... And this is something that gets repeated all over the world, isn't it? I mean, the short... Um, stalk wheat that Henry was referring to was invented by Norman Borlaug and or pioneered by Norman Borlaug um, and was grown in India in Pakistan but also this I mean Frances has a phrase in her book about blind focus on production and which kind of chimes with what you're saying about productivism that actually all over the world quite understandably in response to populations who'd suffered in many cases, much, much worse hunger than we'd suffered in Britain. You'd, you'd, populations on the brink of famine in the case of, even in Western Europe, in the Netherlands, um, that getting enough calories into people, or more than enough, seemed like the most immediate focus, didn't it, for policymakers? Yes, and it was a really potent model because I think it was reinforced technologically. The economic incentives were all going in a particular direction. And I think ideologically, it, it was really robust as well in that there, it was seen as virtuous to be producing more and more and more as cost effectively as possible. So... And I kind of want to bring in Tom here. So like in that model of agriculture, I mean, you're someone that, that grows a lot of your own food as well as cooking it. What limits does that have? Like, if we're just sticking on just describing the crisis, like, what's the problem there with that kind of focus on quantity over diversity and quality? Well, I think <clears throat> the main issue really is a complete disregard for the environment. When the, if I mean, a lot of people describe it as having two. Uh, food systems altogether. We've got the industrial food system or the conventional food system and then the organic or agroecological or even regenerative food system. There's two kind of separate entities. I think in reality there's a lot of blurred lines between the two and I think now conventional agriculture is actually learning a lot from regenerative agriculture and applying it to if it's possible to, to that kind of scale of production. Um, that has its own problems of course and I'm always an advocate for kind of small farms and agroecological farming mm. um, but yeah I mean the main issues that I can see with it are just that it's 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 a different mentality it's a sense of let's kind of rather than working with nature it's working against nature it's okay the nutrients in the soil are, uh, are depleting let's add more chemicals mm. whereas agroecological farming methods are more, okay, how can we support soil health, biodiversity, and so on? So um, coming back to biodiversity, I mean, that's a huge part of your report, Henry, isn't it? Can you just outline a little bit more the crisis in biodiversity? Well, so I think to understand the crisis in biodiversity, you have to understand why you care about biodiversity at all. And there are, um, there are kind of three reasons, really, why you care about it. The first is that it is... The, the richness in the genes that are out there, a very utilitarian reason. Um, there's all sorts of untold um, uh, gifts for mankind in those genes. So um, over 50% of the medicines that we have now are from uh, plants, largely, are from nature. Medicine is full of uh, discoveries of uh, drugs that, from a small plant that no one thought was anything which solved huge amounts of human problems. And 99% of, uh, of um, animals and plants that ever existed are extinct. So, uh, and, we are, and we are destroying them at a rate uh, that since actually we started hunting the megafauna back in 10,000 uh, BC, we're destroying this rate faster than any time since then. The other reason is that there are all sorts of services. So Parthadas Gupta in his review on... Uh, the value, the economic value of biodiversity, which was Treasury, The Economist, points out that while we all think about uh, the, um, the products that we get from those systems, whether that's wood or air or food, actually, they are the, 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 that, those ecosystems are regulating our planet, and in particular, 
they're circulating water and carbon and nitrogen in incredibly complex ways that if they collapse, again, bring the whole of human life to an end. And then the third reason you care about biodiversity is that um, for many of us, there is uh, a value in it that can't be measured. There is a spiritual value, a kind of sacred value in these ecosystems. And a strong sense, I think, for a very large amount of the population. Some people won't even have thought about it. They'll just know they feel better in nature. But I think many of us feel there's a sacred value to, to maintaining biodiversity. And I think biodiversity is one of the things about carbon. So we talked about carbon. I mean, you, you talked about why don't people care about the food system. And I thought about this a lot. Why does no one care about the food system? And the answer is that people care about outputs. So you can get people to be interested in starving children. You can get people to be interested in floods. You can get them to be interested in uh, people having their legs amputated because of diabetes. But you can't get them to be interested in systems. And at the moment, you can't get them to be interested in biodiversity. And one of my real concerns with climate change is we've finally got people interested in climate change. But that is a classic. It is one number. It is one measurement. And nature is so much more complicated than that. And I really worry that in focusing on this one number in climate change, we may well inadvertently cause as many problems in trying to solve that as we did when we solved, when, we, when the number we focused on was calories per hectare. Mm. I wonder if another reason people don't care, which is another aspect of the crisis, I want to return to Francis, Frankie now, is people simply don't see the problem. And one of, I mean, your book is just eye-opening in so many ways. And there's a chapter that is called, Who Asked for Fruit Loops? <laughs> Fruit Loops being the highly coloured, highly sugared breakfast cereal, which if you think Frosties are sugary um, or Cocoa Pops are sugary, that you haven't eaten Fruit Loops. And <laughs> the point that you're making there in an incredibly eloquent, simple way is a point that's also made by Neil and Henry and Tom in their respective work, which is that there's this kind of illusion of choice. A part of the crisis mm. is people, people don't see it as a crisis because they think we have choice and actually a lot of that choice is fake. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. Oh, I so agree with the way you put that. Um, yes, the illusion of choice. I mean, you walk into a US supermarket and you see aisle after aisle with all these different labels and you don't know that they're just a few corporations that are providing these and particularly, you know, it, that is um, a US reality. And so um, I, I am so glad about the focus on biodiversity because I agree that um, so much, I want you to know, I want you to know, Henry, that I've been including that as a key point, key point in everything I'm talking about these days because it is much less, um, it's much less, you know, get your hands around it kind of uh, point for people, I agree. And it's, it's so absolutely key. I, one of the stats I use, I'd love your feedback, is that, um, uh, uh, that 40% of insects uh, will be, are predicted to be extinct in uh, the next few decades. And of course, insects are basic to it all. So uh, it's just terrifying. And so I, um, I in, in my oh, efforts, I um, always try to focus on possibility. I, I use that word, not optimism, because I don't think optimism is possible right now. All humans need is a sense of possibility that we can, we can get our heads around this conversation and make it real and so it's exciting. And so I, 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 I love to talk about it as uh, we don't have to believe in that all oh, it's gonna work out. All we have to see is that it's possible that our acts can make a difference. And so that's why, um, I, you know, like to throw in examples of, say, should I should I go into some of my uh, glimmer, glimmers of hope? I think I'm going to, in a moment, I just want one more okay. little bit of yeah. crisis. So I want to just kind of sum up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I'm really aware that, I mean, Neil's book is a really sort of stark vision of why Britain Britain's agriculture right now is not going to meet anything close to net zero. So could you just very briefly give us the kind of the climate overview of the crisis? And then I want the sivers of hope. We need some sivers of hope. Um, so I think the food system overall is contributing around about a third of emissions globally. It's around about a quarter, I think. I mean, the, you know, the, the numbers vary from year to year a bit. Um, but as 
we sort of grapple with electricity generation and we've got the ban on, on diesel and petrol cars coming in from 2030 and there's lots of progress on transport as those other big polluting areas get sorted out. So the food system is going to become more and more prominent as a, as, as a cause and there's lots of methane emissions from livestock. Um, Fertiliser use is a, is a key contributor. And then the way that, that, that all of the machinery and the mechanisation uh, and the, the way that agricultural buildings are, are managed and run as well. So there's all sorts of different so, sorts of emissions. Um, and I think it's only really in the last decade or so that we've begun to get a, a, a perspective on, on that. Um, and it comes after a huge succession of environmental problems around biodiversity and landscape change and mm. public health scares. Mm. Um, but I wonder whether having that net zero target for 2050 and emissions, and I know Henry's worried about carbon sort of uh, mm. suffocating all of the other issues, but it does provide a new kind of orienting principle and a goal. And, uh, uh, and, and maybe it might be a way that some of these other issues can be tackled mm. in the round. So I do want to get to the Sivers of Hope. I've just raised this one more huge bit of the crisis we haven't mentioned. I want Henry to talk a little bit about the ways in which Ukraine has made the pre-existing crisis even worse. I just wanted to summarise some of what's been said so far. So there's agreement that, I mean, things said so far, it's a crisis of democracy. I mean, I actually searched for the word crisis in Francis's book and I found a food and farming crisis, a water crisis, an environmental crisis, a nitrogen overload crisis, a toxic waste crisis, a democracy crisis, and then these other things that we've said, what Tom's talked about, about the biodiversity crisis and the ways in which Henry has talked about this system which began as a miracle but now in many ways is a miracle and a disaster. The massive, massive public health crisis that you've described and then the biodiversity crisis that can't actually just be reduced to numbers because it's something much bigger and more important and beautiful to all of us, to anyone that is living on this planet. But Henry, taking all of these terrible Feeling really crises, stressed. Ukraine, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> you said we've been we've discussing this topic a little bit via email and Henry, very scary, except he didn't use the word very. Um, <laughs> um, can you tell us the, about your very scary conversation you had recently with an expert on distribution? Yeah, so, it's, so, so we've, ha we've, we've been through in this country three food system crises, all man-made. So we went through Brexit. We then went through COVID, which was man-made because it was our decision to shut down supply chains, whether or not that was right. You know, it didn't stop food growing. And now we have Ukraine. And Ukraine is pretty straightforward, really. And it comes from the fact that we got very good at, uh, at um, storing and transporting food. And that's fantastic because it means that if you have a failure of harvest somewhere, uh, you can transport food to those people and you can stop them starving. It's also led to very large human populations in areas which would never be able to produce enough food to feed those populations. Egypt, for example, is one of them. Egypt imports 50% of its wheat. Um, and, and Ukraine and Russia between them export 17% of the world's wheat to the world, uh, along with a lot of the sunflower oil. And at the moment, I, I was talking to David Beasley last week, who's the head of the UN's World Food Programme, and he had been in Odessa the day before. And he's, he was saying that the, that the grain silos from last year's harvest in Ukraine are full. They think that this year's harvest uh, is likely to be 60, 70 percent uh, of, of normal, so not a complete disaster. Um, but it's going to have nowhere to go. So when they pull in that harvest in August, there's no way of getting that wheat from the world. Normally it goes through Odessa uh, and some of the other ports on the south coast. And um, the volume of that seabound traffic is so huge that you would never be able to get it out by road through Poland. So he described it. He said that the Ukrainians described that as trying to empty a, a swimming pool with a teaspoon. Mm. And so we basically, in his view, have a number of weeks until September to work out how to make Odessa, which currently has two scuttled ships blocking the harbour, scuttled by the Ukrainians, surrounded by mines, it's the most dangerous piece of ocean in the world, to work out how to get Odessa to be a neutral uh, worst port so we can get that grain out. Now, if we don't get that grain out, what happens? Well, it depends where you live. So 
um, what happens is food shortage, prices go up. Uh, if you live in North Africa, uh, Middle East, where price is a huge part of your daily budget, that means societal breakdown, riots, regime change. You know, we'll see what we had in the, in the Arab Spring, plus a lot. And here it means those in food poverty a plunge, deep uh, a, a plunge deeper into food poverty, um, which is a different. You know, we have there are solutions that we could. There are solutions to our problem. I wouldn't want to be the minister for food in Egypt okay. at the moment. We're going to come back to the solution to our problem. I want to come to Frankie with some slivers of hope, and then I'm going to go to Tom with some other slivers of hope. <laughs> I think we've, we've had enough crisis now. <laughs> well, of um, I, I like to point out very specific examples, but I'll start with our own country. It's, it's not really a story, but just uh, one fact I included in the new chapter is that our, in one, in one uh, decade, the acreage of organic agriculture grew, um, doubled in one, one decade. And that to me was one of the big surprises because you never hear about it in, in, in this country. Uh, but I often go back to a trip I took in uh, 2000 with my daughter, Anna, to this city of Belo Horizonte. Do you know Belo in uh, Brazil? Have you, have you heard their story? No. Um, well, they, um, when we were there in 2000, they were just beginning a commitment uh, by, the, by, the, government, by the, the city government to bring all sectors together from religious groups to business people to farmers of all sizes and to come up with a strategy to end hunger in Belo Horizonte. They haven't ended it, but they have done what a lot of people would think would be impossible. But by bringing all the voices together, they uh, managed to cut the child mortality rate in half in, uh, over this period, of, uh, actually less uh, by in about 15 or fewer years. And uh, they did it in the most creative ways by, by allowing and supporting. Again, the market was not golden, right? You could, you could make the market work for our values so that small farmers were enabled and to have um, uh, their stands of fresh food in the poorest areas with prices that were, were held in a place that people could actually afford them. They created people's restaurants and I ate in one of them and they're sprinkled around the city so that you can get a good meal for, you know, really, really cheap. Uh, they include now um, uh, really healthy additives into the flour that is baking the bread for the, ch or the, the what the children eat for breakfast and uh, on and on. Um, and teaching uh, kids about plants. And uh, they have, as part of their curriculum, children work every, every week in, in the school garden and orchard. So they brought many pieces together and had this incredible effect. And I'll just, in this, in this little example with this, we talked to the woman, Adriana Aranha, who was a key player then in the year 2000. Um, uh, she, um, she said what was, she was very emotional and said, what upsets me so was how easy it is to end it, to end hunger. Once you bring people together, once you can empower people to, to come up with creative solutions, uh, well, that's my addition. But I was so moved by that, that, you know, the cliche, it's not rocket science, uh, that uh, once people are enabled to actually come up with solutions, it really has worked. Uh, not perfectly, of course, but made enormous difference. And so I like to spread the story because many people have not heard it. And I suppose the more stories we hear like that, the more that other places might become empowered to act like that. And it is striking. It comes back to this point that several people have made that once you see how much food matters, then everything changes. I mean, another example of the comparable change would be the city of Amsterdam that was one of the first places in the world to bring down child obesity. And again, it was through completely shared action across schools, food businesses, politicians, parents, all of whom came together with a shared understanding of child health is all of our responsibility. It's not just your responsibility or that person's responsibility. We're never going to blame the child and we're just going to create a set of shared values around health and it made a huge change. 
Tom, I want to bring you in with whether cooking can become one of the solutions. Um, I was very struck when I first read your book that one of the words in the title is pleasure and your chapters are a series of manifestos really about cooking but I think your very first one is something like cook with love and confidence. How can that help? Um, well, <laughs> earlier when Henry was talking about the kind of enormity of the crisis, I, I, I just wanted to jump in and say, and, and therefore, you know, it's really one of our biggest hopes for a, for a solution, is you, the, the kind of massive impact and far-reaching impact of our food system from everything, you know, to, to people in Brazil or around the world, in famine to the overproduction of food in, in America and the UK and elsewhere. It's just a, this incredible opportunity and through, yeah, through my work, which began kind of to be centered around food waste and the food paradox of food waste and, and famine, um, it, it, I, I wanted to create really as a chef, as you know, a practical person, uh, a manifesto for people to um, take on board all the incredible academic work that had been done over the last several decades and make it into this kind of actionable um, and, yeah, um, tangible um, approach. So <laughs> having said that, what became clear to me also was that actually, you know, food is pleasure. Food is, is life. Food is is everything, but it's to ignore that would be a, a huge issue, not just for ourselves as human beings, but for um, you know the the sake of sustainability itself. How could a diet be sustainable if it's not pleasurable? Because it's not going to be adopted mm. by the population or by people. Um, I've read a lot of slow food and Carlo Petrini and and. I feel quite close to the slow food values, which are all about kind of local uh, local solutions. And so that's kind of worked its way into my work in a kind of deeply ingrained way. So beyond cooking with love, confidence and creativity, which is one of the first chapters in my book, I, well, I quite quickly kind of found myself thinking about biodiversity and the, the sixth great a, uh, mass extinction that everyone's been talking about um, but you know then therefore referring to and thinking about how we can support the biodiversity mm. so and cooking is one of the ways because it's yes. one of the easiest ways you can take back control of ingredients and use a greater variety of ingredients than the ultra processed foods written about in Francis's book and I just, want to sorry yes sorry um, just importantly the the best way I think you can do that is through supporting agrodiversity mm. and better farming but we can talk more mm. about that later of course yeah because it's not just the raw ingredients are not a given either I wanted to bring Neil in now because there was a phrase that jumped out that you used of something about a crisis being an opportunity and this is something that Neil's book I mean suggest reflection on like is do you see solutions potentially coming out of the crisis in the same way that the second world war was a crisis that produced a radical shift in british food policy in the past well there's that sense of sort of don't waste a good crisis and crises do open up opportunities for more fundamental change and and the current food system can be thought of as a product of the crisis of the second world war um, so uh, I, I guess it's a hope, and, and I raise the question of whether the, the climate crisis, coupled with the, the kind of COVID convulsion that we've been through, opens up that question to ask more, more, more sort of fundamental questions about the way that we've organised things. And, and uh, people can also, I think, see through something like COVID um, a means of government and public agencies and society acting for a, a common public good in, in a way that, you know, we lapse into that. We've got, a, we've got a prevailing political ideology of sort of neoliberal markets are the best way of sorting everything out and, and governments should have as little to do with interfering in that world. Um, you know, that, that, that is something that's a product of the last 40 years 
in, mm. in particular. It hasn't always been that way. And, and crises do sort of unsettle some of those fundamental assumptions. And, uh, you know, having a lockdown and everyone having to sort of... Th we've seen it with the great re resignation and uh, people moving to the country and, off, you know, re rent, rent, uh, office rents in, in big cities and working from home and all of that. We're seeing quite a lot of reorganisation of our economy and our, our way of living. Um, so why not think about the food system in the same way? And Henry, coming to solutions, I mean, one of the, the examples you write about in the report is Finland um, as an example of like how solutions can come about by doing lots and lots of things at once. I mean, that's one of the repeated themes in the food strategy that um, it's not going to be this solution or that solution, it's going to be lots of things overlapping. Yeah, yeah I think <clears throat> you first of all have to recognise what is causing the problem. And fundamentally, there are two things causing the problem. On the nature side, uh, we treat nature as a resource. We don't cost it into anything we do. You can't count it in your wallet. It's not in the balance sheet of companies. It's not in the way we measure GDP. And we have pillaged nature to create prosperity. And again, Das Gupta in his report estimates not only do we not cost it, governments worldwide subsidise nature-destructing activities to the tune of $500 billion a year, causing three to seven trillion dollars of destruction to nature. So we know that if we bring nature into the system, which is something only governments can do, that there is a solution there. On the health side, and we touched on this a bit with the Fruit Loops, you know, uh, last time I counted, which was last January, there were 28 kinds of Kit Kat uh, available for sale in the UK. And you say, well, why is that? It's not, uh, it's not as if the company bosses wake up every morning and think, what dastardly ways can we think up to kill our children and destroy the NHS? They are thinking of ways to make money. I mean... well, so, exactly. So, so, what... What is happening, and we call this the junk food cycle in the report, is you have a feedback loop between our evolved appetite, which evolved to seek out and eat highly calorie-dense foods mm -hmm. in vast quantities, and if they didn't contain fibre, to get full less quickly. Mm -hmm. And over time, companies, therefore, have invested more marketing and R&D budgets into those foods. We've eaten more, they've invested more, we've eaten more, they've invested more, and we've got sick. I went to see... Uh, and, and a lot of them don't like it. I went to speak at uh, Weetabix's um, kind of annual get-together the other day, and Weetabix is really interesting. On the cereal front, they are pretty good compared with Fruit Loops or Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes. Uh, but all their last releases have been Alpen with chocolate, mm. uh, Weetabix with sugar and chocolate. Mm. And they don't like that, but they, they say will... say they don't like that. They do, no, seriously, you don't, you, they don't, they'll get fired if they don't do it. The CEO will get fired if he doesn't do it. And he is cares they more... They don't like it enough to leave the company. I mean, no, no, I, exactly. Uh, yeah. So he cares more about his... Th that's all he's done. That's all yeah. he's learned. He knows how to market things. Interestingly, more and more of them, as they come out of the mm. thing, are saying this is bad. So Dave Lewis from Tesco, uh, Roger Whiteside from Greg's ex-CEOs are saying, I was stuck in this. Mm. The only way that you can break that, though, you can't rely on personal morality. It's no good just saying, why don't you all leave your jobs? I mean, right, it's not going to happen. Um, so you have to break that with a, a, a commercial intervention. You have to, the government has to intervene to make that food less commercially attractive. So we know the solutions. Second thing that is interesting is those two things, which people like Frankie, Francis, Frankie, can't, can't, <laughs> Frankie. so we weird, Colin, I mean, always read this, Francis in my mind. respect you so, so much is that Francis more lapping, we just <laughs> need to adapt to Frankie. You know, some Frankie people have, some nice. people have known this for a long time, but until very recently, most people in the UK, for example, most people in the Western world on health, thought that you got sick because you didn't have self-control and you didn't exercise enough. And so if you were, had diabetes, it was your own fat fault because you didn't get off your arse and do something about it. Mm -hmm. That now, within the NHS and in the Tory party, mm -hmm. is understood not to be the case. We now know that, education, uh, that exercise is great for all sorts of things but doesn't help you lose weight. And we know that it is about the food environment. And that is accepted. But people are still struggling. Even they're you still struggling. don't name it fully as ultra-processed food. Well, that, that, still no, sorry. it high fat. Well, no, so because it's not so... Uh, we will differ on this. But if you look at ultra-processed food, we don't... So it is clearly the case that 
the majority of ultra, what you would call ultra processed food is high. As long as me, I didn't. No, okay, well, yeah, the resident, no, no. <laughs> It's high in sugar, salt, fat, and yeah, low... Yeah, but a lot of it's also high uh, in artificial uh, yeah, I understand, I understand. Mm. And you know it, I know, I know you... So, what I'm saying is, it may well be, that is a big problem, it mm. may well be that there are other things in that food that are causing problems as well. But I think that the, you know, getting into a debate about whether, you know, about ultra post food, I do call I go into it, I say it's a problem. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not as obsessed by it as as you are. I'm obsessed by the fact that the food <laughs> companies are creating stuff that's killing us mm. and that that needs to stop. So whether you call it ultra processed... I, I think the definition is matter because I think it matters that you state what the crisis is in order to come up with solutions. But I wanted to I wanted to bring Frankie back in at this point because of some of the things... I mean, I, I think that was really useful insight in terms of like the inside thinking of what it's like for the people in the cereal companies and how difficult it is to get change within that locked-in system. And one of the themes in Frankie's book that comes up again and again and again is, well, you can wait for change within that system or you can just buy a way out of it completely. I mean, one of the liberating thoughts you keep coming up with is like, well, you go to the supermarket and there's all this choice and it's not really choice and it's Fruit Loops or it's something that pretends not to be Fruit Loops, but it's still not that healthy. And you keep talking about the fact you can shop somewhere else and how amazing it is when you go and buy your food in a different environment and suddenly um, all of the choices available are ones that aren't going to impact your health in the same way. I just, I wanted to, as, as another sliver of hope, I mean, I completely agree with you, Henry, that there needs to be structural change, there needs to be governmental intervention. But in the meantime, what can we as individuals do? Are we hopeless and powerless? Well, you're not going to be surprised that I'm going to say that every act we make and don't make changes the world around us. And so as we make new choices, somebody is always watching. And so that is rippling out. But as we talk about this, be, this particular point is that we have to confront the extreme economic inequality that, that is coupled, that is a product of our corrupted, in, I'm speaking now in the US, but it, in different forms in many countries that has corrupted our democracy. And so that, the, as I was pointing out earlier, I believe that there are a thousand agribusiness lobbyists in Washington that are working toward the, the, what brings the highest profit for their clients. And uh, I just want to add this fact for the US, 60% of our calories now come from this ultra processed food, okay. empty, empty, empty. And that is just really alarming to me. So back to your, your question, changing where we shop. Yes, I can shop uh, in places that I can access um, whole foods and um, uh, delicious, tempting, uh, uh, even processed foods that it, are very rich in nutrients. I can join my community support to agriculture, which I love. I just have to go up the hill and grab it. But not everyone can do that. So that's why, and most people can't in this country. Mm -hmm. So we have to also bring into our conversation uh, the extreme economic inequality that must be part of, I think, this conversation because it is this access question. Um, so I'd, I'd love to have a response to that. And I also, uh, anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I, yeah, I, there's just so much more to say. And I'm aware that we've, we're coming up to five to eight, and eight o'clock is when we said we go to audience questions. Um, I just maybe I'd just go around each of you and just for a kind of I feel like each of you has so much more to say on this so maybe just go around each of you and each of you say one thing that you hoped you could have said <laughs> when we started that that my questions haven't allowed you to so just freestyle Neil well I think we should bear in mind that we've we're, we're stopping the sale of diesel and petrol fueled cars from 2030 so taking a regulatory move set it a few years ahead and that's forcing system change in private road transport. And I think we need to think in those sort of terms about, about the food system. It, it does require uh, government action. Um, mm. and, and I think we will get there, actually, before too long. Mm. Tom? Um, I guess I'd just like to say that I think our actions as individuals do hugely matter, and even more so as chefs and businesses, as food businesses, because our impact is multiplied by the mouths that we're feeding. Um, and, but as individuals, we're part of a kind of food community, whether that's around the table 
or the kind of global food system. Um, and I think that the, the humble veg box is the keystone to a sustainable diet. And luckily in the UK, most people have access to that. And I also think it's one of the most affordable ways to, to, to kind of eat and base your shopping around those ideally seasonal, local, and if possible, organic vegetables, and then kind of bolt on those more exotic and mm. meat products if you want to. It's problematic, isn't it? Because the, the, sorry, I've said, I'm just going to allow you to freeze out now. I just have Great to answer that. But the point that Frank has just made about extreme economic inequality, I completely agree with you that anyone that can afford to get a veg box, it's, I mean, it's transformed the way I eat. I think I've probably had one for 15 years now and it makes me eat seasonally. I would otherwise forget about so many root vegetables in the winter months and it just enables you to do that in a way that's very simple and it's local. But there are people on bare bones budgets who, as Henry was saying, with the Ukraine crisis um, are now going to be pushed even further into poverty who are living in housing where their kitchen doesn't have an oven. They might be lucky to have a microwave and a kettle. Or and time so, like, to even cook. Yeah, so when I, yeah. I just think it's worth mentioning that affordable means a whole bunch of different things, doesn't it? Yeah. Depending on income. Yeah. And there are these bigger issues, the, the issue that Frankie raised at the very beginning about democracy, that there are these things... I mean, food itself, I think, is bigger than food, but there are also these things which, like, food itself isn't maybe able to meet in a vacuum. Henry? Yeah, so I'd say just a couple of things. First is, inequality has increased in all human societies since the Stone Age over time in the absence of mass mobilised warfare or famine. And uh, we cannot expect the food system to solve the problem of poverty. Uh, there are ways in which we can uh, make it less harmful to those in poverty. Uh, but in the end, people who are in poverty have much less, uh, are worse affected by the system for all sorts of reasons, have less ability to get themselves out of it for their own free will. And that we cannot expect the food system to solve that problem. That's an economic problem. That's for uh, different kinds of brains. The second thing I would say is just re reinforcing what these guys said. So. The government action is absolutely necessary. You cannot break those two feedback loops, the junk food cycle, the invisibility of nature without government action, but it is not sufficient. So you cannot shoot people if they don't serve good food in schools. You can't imprison someone for putting up a, well, yes, you probably could, for putting a chocolate sales in hospital lobbies. Maybe you should do that. Actually, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, you can imprison a lot of but people. Every, you can imprison a lot of people. Every, every, if I think about what local means to me, because there are all sorts of questions about what... And economically, there are all sorts of things that are local that aren't particularly useful or good, but every single plate of food that was... Nutritious plate of food that was served... Delicious plate of food that was served to someone was served by someone who cared. Mm. And I think that the most important thing about the local and the community solutions, and I... The, uh, and, and, and funny enough, the, the description in Brazil of getting community together, getting doctors to talk to farmers, to talk to schools, to talk to politicians, there is an awful lot that can be done by harnessing that local care. And so I think you have to have, you have, to have both. I think that's a wonderful note on which to end the, uh, this part of the discussion. And now I, let's open it um, to audience questions. So there will be some audience questions coming in by Polly Russell, from our online audience, and then I hope people here as well. Yeah, Gavin, um, I think are microphones coming round, or they will, be. they will be. Okay, so we've got someone over here. Yeah, and then we've got someone here. Hi there. Uh, my name's Gavin. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, my name is Gavin. I'm a food systems consultant and food policy uh, expert on TikTok. And um, <laughs> now. Food systems people love a crisis. Frankie's been writing about them for 50 years. Uh, Edward de Pommian wrote about the uh, trouble, how people didn't have enough time to cook over 100 years ago. So we love a crisis. Um, I was wondering if the panel, this is anyone, this is open to anyone on the panel, if they would like to share any uh, positive stories of things that they see coming up in the near future that they have a lot of hope for or they feel more positively about. Frankie? Well, this probably isn't an enough direct answer to your question, but it is definitely something positive that addresses what we were so we are so concerned about, and that is biodiversity. 
Can I go with that? Yeah, go for it. Because it all relates. Um, one of the things that has most encouraged me is the spread of agroforestry. And I'd love others to comment on it. Because now, uh, I just checked, it's about the area worldwide, the size of the country of Canada, is now con using agroforestry, the mixing of crops and trees in the same fields, which helps uh, in biodiversity, um, maintenance, and hopefully restoration, and also deals with you know, the <laughs> cooling the earth from climate uh, crisis. And um, it is empowering for farmers in Niger, where I've, I've been so impressed, particularly there, where farmers are teaching farmers and converting to this after and re-establishing forests with crops, um, a forest that had been um, ruined, you know, destroyed under colonialism. And I just see this approach as empowering. It's it, it power is dispersed because farmers are working with farmers and it's addressing biodiversity and it's improving diets and it's working well for protection from climate chaos. And I just would like to throw that in, but I yeah. know we're, we want to go back to the- That's um, great. Does anyone else want to jump in to answer that? Well, I, I do feel quite sort of intellectually energized by the net zero thing. I mean, it was 2019, we were the first country to make a statutory commitment to move to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And now I think it's something like 80% of countries in the world have a, have a target and a plan to, to power down um, greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that that's all catalyzing an awful lot of um, science and intellectual activity about well, what's that going to mean for our systems of organizing ourselves. And um, you, you know, 2050 is not too far away really. Um, and so I feel quite positive about that. You look at countries like the Netherlands, they've got plans which include their food system you know, with targets. So I think increasingly we, we will see that. And, and we've seen in this country how it's worked with electricity generation. Did you want to say Yeah, that? so just, I mean, two very quick ones. Uh, one is in the UK, and it now looks as though it's going to happen in, in the EU, we're going to stop paying billions and billions of pounds a year to farmers to, to produce food and destroy nature. And we're starting to realise that is just a crazy way to spend money and we're going to spend it to produce public goods. And it looks like we might be in for a big revolution in the UK. That would be incredible. The second one, which you're going to hate, is if you... Um... Why am I going to hate it? <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are... Basically, you can boil it down to, if you had to do two things, on the environmental side, you would eat less meat. As mm. Frankie pointed out, it's just absurd how much land we use mm. to grow meat. And you need that land to restore nature. It, on the food side, you'd eat less ultra-processed foods, less high food, high in fat, salt and sugar, etc. On the meat side, I think that the, uh, the protein alternatives, a large amount of that meat is eaten in junk food uh, in the form of milk powder, and protein alternatives are very soon going to undercut that. And so you will see, because of that junk food, which you hate, you will actually see a short... I kind of love it. I mean, no, yeah. that's... It's, no, no, but, you know, but you will see hate. that there is huge... Uh, suddenly, huge uh, amounts of dairy production and meat production will become economically unsustainable. And Why so, do you think I'm going to hate it? <laughs> because it's ultra-processed food, because it's going into food that's making people ill. <laughs> yeah, so it no, is. no, no, I don't so, want so, to be So, Ill. you know, the, I, yeah. the, the, the dream is everyone eats uh, pulses and nuts and lots of vegetables. Mm. I don't believe you're going to move that processed diet fast enough to prevent the, to prevent the environmental catastrophe mm -hmm. and therefore I welcome stuff that doesn't do anything to make that processed food less. But both things could happen. Well, both things once. happen, but exactly. Yeah, I mean my... They'll slowly, my there'll be two transitions. If, if someone's, you know, my sister's vegetarian and two of her kids have go between vegetarian and vegan and my feeling is if you're going to eat a hot dog, why not eat a vegetarian hot dog because it's such an ultra processed product in any case and it doesn't taste that different, and the impact, as you say, is completely different. But, I mean, long term, I don't think ultra-processed... No, it can't, it can't. It I got sent... I, got... Because, I mean, you don't want to make more people ill through their diet, and neither do I, so I, mean, I think yeah. we agree about I that. I got sent a, a bag of uh, fake chicken wing, chicken nuggets from the States the other day, which includes <laughs> certain GM foods that we can't, we're not allowed to sell here. And my son only... I've got a, a son who eats meat and fruit and a vegetarian daughter... And these chicken nuggets tasted 
disgusting slash delicious. They tasted like really cheap chicken nuggets, incredibly Moorish. And both of them, I had to like, I had to, I got sent five kilos. <laughs> And I had to secretly throw them away because they weren't so eating. Moorish. They wouldn't eat anything else, which was could be a disaster for their health, but great for the environment. We had a question, sorry, <laughs> over here in the second, here in the second row, sorry, here, and then then also just two along, and then I, I should see from Polly whether there are some online. Yeah. Yes, you. Yes, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, Francis, just say first of all, my wife is from Villa Rosa Mancha, and I've been there a number of times, and. Uh, that's a new story to me, actually, so I was really interested to see more of that. But, uh, my question, actually, um, it's re I was really interested in the comparisons between the past and the present, that you're talking about the 1940s, which was a, a decade of very progressive thinking, if you think about Howard, Balfour, these kind of books, and then somewhat everything got kicked into touch by the war and Green Revolution, and this desire to sort of control, scale, industrialise process if you want to call it that and we're in a kind of similar period now if you like and you're touching right there on the meat free and the whole I'm going to push to veganism and the processed role within so many of those products which are obviously very profit driven as well and as to whether that's a little bit of out of the frying pan into the fire in, in the longer term issues that that might raise for us not only our health but also the whole situation um, I was um, thinking do we need now almost a whereas Rachel Carson and what she did regarding DDT in the 1970s, for example, a voice such as that to refer to the poor. One of the biggest issues, I think, is around glyphosate in the food production system. Um, it ties into GM. It's something that is very well covered in the US, and, and there are some great voices out there, people like Zach Bush and people like that, who talk a lot about it and doing a lot of campaigning with regards to glyphosate. And it's very little talked about, as far as I can see here. In fact, last week I heard Patrick Holden on his Sustainable Food Trust podcast. It's the first time I've heard two English voices discussing glyphosate on a podcast, and it came off the House of Lords decision last week with regards to uh, the future GM in the food system. So I just wanted to ask, really, the question is, would it take something like a DDT moment relating to glyphosate to really push the debate forward with regards to what is really wrong with the food system here and that people really understood the impact of, of that kind of thing on public health? I guess, I mean, since you're asking about the, moving the debate forward in Britain, I'm going to ask one of the three British... I mean, Neil, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I mean, agrochemical use generally be, just became really central to the functioning of food production very quickly um, after the Second World War. Uh, I think it, it was being adopted a, a, li a little bit earlier in the, in the US, but we sort of took that technology um, and, and it's just become vital to rotations and the whole system so one of the eye-opening things i found in your book like you talk about the extent to which pesticides were sort of mandated and there was a language about sort of cleanness or like mm. farms like as, as if it was like their duty to keep them free of pests there were, there were committees at the county level of farmers and advisors who would go around and in inspect whether you're keeping your weeds down <laughs> and and farmers who weren't modernizing rapidly enough you know, tenant farmers could be um, have their tenancy um, ended and could be moved off the land. So there were there were really quite strong interventionist regulatory powers, which which proceeded right through to the mid 1950s. And farmers were um, kicked off their farms for not modernising and not not entering into the spirit of the agricultural revolution. Hundreds of them. Hmm. Did, does anyone? But Zinni, you asked a question on health as well, I think. And, yeah, and, and uh, so if you look at health. Uh, we, are, we talk about like the boiler, there's a, there's a kind of systems trap which is known as um, eroding of expectations or the boiling the frog syndrome. And uh, the comparison that we make in the food strategy is that uh, diet rate disease kills more people uh, every year, killed more people last year than COVID. And if that problem, self-inflicted man-made problem, had hit us at once, uh, you'd say, you know, who knows what mankind would do about it? Well, we now know what mankind would do about it. They, if, it took, if it's what it took, they'd lock up the world's population indoors. They'd take huge interventionist measures. But because the problem has creeped up on us year over year, you know, if you look at obesity, it's just like, it's like a wave that's gradually moved since the 50s when almost no one was obese all the way through. It's just hit us very slowly, each year increasing. And so your question is like, do you need a Rachel Carson, you know, Silent Spring type voice? Uh, it would help, <laughs> um, uh, but it's, I, you know, it's I. 
it is a, a, I think we've now, because so many people suffered from, you know, it was interesting, I was speaking to James Bethel, who was a minister uh, in the NHS during COVID, and he's become a massive kind of campaigner for diet now within the Tory party, trying to change their view. And he said, I was just on, every morning we had a call with a hospital and they were talking about who was in intensive care. And it was all, like, so often it was diet-related disease that was driving those people in. And that's completely changed his personal view. And I think, you know, we need, we need to, we still do it. We'd great if there is someone who can do the Rachel Carson job in this country, but it couldn't hurt. So we have another question in this row. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, a big thank you to the pan panel. Um, that was depressing and inspiring in equal measure. Um, and you talked a lot about crises, and um, I'd just like to unfortunately add another crisis that we're experiencing at the moment, and that is a very real and devastating cost of living crisis here in the UK at the moment. And I was just wondering um, what policies the panellists would advocate to encourage sustainable diets during this cost of living crisis. I'm maybe going to go back to Frankie first. Like, what policies for to deal with the cost of living crisis? Well, I certainly think that um, to make more and more clear to everyone uh, that um, a a plant based I now call it plant and planet based centered uh, diet uh, can actually save a lot of um, money and and make you healthier at the same time. And so I think that. It's, it's really the access, um, again, back to that challenge of such extreme concentration, three uh, people control as much wealth in the United States as the bottom half, right? So who has access even to you know, the healthy legumes, dried legumes and grains that together are just so healthy for us, not to mention the fresh foods. So I, 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 I hope I'm not uh, singing the same song over and over, I am, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, that, that we have to see all the pieces woven uh, and, and constantly address, um, and I feel this so strongly in our corrupted democracy, that how do we make clear that without um, a, a, a political democracy answering to citizens, we can't have um, economic democracy that answers to our human needs. And, and it's only as we make that, that change. And I, I just feel that that's got to come up in every conversation about, about food. And um, so I'll leave it at that at the moment. Neil, policies to address cost of living crisis. I mean, this, do, this doesn't feel very complicated or difficult, really. It's pretty straightforward. There is enough money and assets and resources in the economy, really. So it's, it's not really a food system thing, it's just about uh, mm -hmm. how you use a resource and it's a tax and welfare really. There's no need for people to be uh, going hungry and, and, and suffering to the levels that they, uh, that they are. And the existence of food banks that we see on the rise, both in the US and UK, is that something that, that you see that should be existing in civilised, relatively wealthy societies? I don't think the increasing number of food banks is, is a positive indicator of the way that society's working. Um, what it is is a positive reflection of the efforts that people will go to to try and make a, a sort of difference and help others. Mm. But, um, you know, they don't have food banks in Germany, do they? Mm. I mean, I, just kind of very specifically answering that question, because I think that France is right. In the long term, a cultural shift will help. But in the short term, you can do two things. Um, you can give people food or you can give them money. And uh, we made the argument that actually, although some people see it as paternalistic, why don't you do both? As some people see it as paternalistic, if you look at programmes such as Healthy Start, which gives fruit and veg and milk to uh, families who are, where either the mother is pregnant or they've got young kids, uh, school food meal, uh, free school meals, holiday activity and food programmes, there is clear evidence that they get better nutrition than if you gave them the same amount of money. At the same time, uh, financial exchanges, money is important. I, my, my instinct, if I was the government at the moment, would be to give that to local authorities rather than through the benefit system, because the local authorities are the ones who know 
exactly where the real problem is. They know where the problems in their community are. And those problems don't always cut as neatly across what your welfare payment is because of people's circumstances. So at the moment, if you're dealing with a crisis, if you were to, to, going to increase the, the benefits by X, I would actually deliver that through local councils rather than just through a, a, a blanket increase of benefits. Tom, did you have anything to say on the cost of living crisis before um, we go to the online? Just, I was just thinking that really, I think a lot of the man-made crises that we're talking about stem from really a disconnection with nature, ultimately. And that, that's a conclusion that I came to through writing my book as well, that really, you know, actually this, the, the solutions are about us trying to reconnect with, with nature and what better way than to do that through food. So reconnecting people with cooking and just and, and with the farms and with the countryside as much as possible. I don't understand food policy, so I don't know how you do that, but that's the kind of direction I want to go in. Polly, are there some online questions? Yeah, there are absolutely loads of online oh, questions. Oh, wow, OK. So I'm going to apologise already because we're not going to get to all of them at all or even mm. any We can of give them. short answers, but, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, but a lot of questions. Yes and no, yes and no answers only. I just, yeah, so this one, people, you touched on this across the panel, but I think it's a kind of good, well, it's a question probably lots of people are thinking, which is just how can the average person make a tangible difference to improve our food system? And that comes from Bella. Frankie, how can the average person make a tangible difference to improve our food system? Well, we all have a sphere of influence, right? We all do. And so the more that we align with what we know is necessary for us and for others, the planet, we, we definitely have influence. And every opportunity through our churches and synagogues and, and community organizations and through who we elect to represent us, we become spokespeople for the kind of insights that I've so appreciated today. And so um, we have power. And I think that that is so important for us to, to realize because the greatest danger is that more and more of us feel powerless and, and resigned. So the power that we have, we're all influencers. We all are. Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, sure. So, um, well, Reducing your waste is something that we can all afford to do and that will save us money. Eating more plants, having a plant-rich diet, again, is going to save us money. And I think if you can <clears throat> put that towards a budget to supporting better farming, um, buying your veg box, uh, buying organic if you can, if you can't afford an all-organic diet, then... There's a brilliant thing called the Dirty Dozen, which mm. describes the kind of most pesticide-ridden uh, fruit and vegetables. But, yeah, going back to the, the Keystone veg box. Mm. Thank you. Next question. So, uh, this one is, uh, Henry, thank you so much for this brilliant discussion. This is from Chloe. Henry and Neil and others rightly highlight the urgent need for government intervention in the food system. Can Henry give any insight on the barriers that seem to be preventing the government acting comprehensively on his review and what can be done to address these when force critical action needed? So it's interesting. So the things that have been, uh, have been put in place already, uh, quite a few of the food poverty recommendations were put in place because Marcus Rashford decided to campaign for them, which was quite helpful. Uh, and so that is where you get kind of pol enough political momentum. There was then, there was a bunch of stuff on food education and on community work on health in the community that went into the levelling up white paper, and that was because Michael Gove, who is now in the department for levelling up, originally was in DEFRA when I was commissioned to do this work, and he cares about the food system, and he slipped it in without people spotting it. We've now got uh, the kind of big environmental things, which DEFRA is uh, responding to, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and then there's going to be a health inequalities white paper following after that. And the blocks is, we don't have it nearly as bad as in the States, but there are definitely, through the federations, the industry bodies, huge amounts of disinformation going into government. Um, I'm always trying to get them to speak to the CEOs rather than the federations. Uh, and then secondly, there is still, you know, there are some very real, at the moment, you've got, it was interesting. When we did the, on the salt and sugar reformulation tax, when we did the focus groups on that, People actually, even people, we did focus groups all across the country, even people in poverty liked the idea because it was going to get 
the crap out. They hate their chick kids being sold the stuff that was going to get it out of the system. Whereas meat, they just didn't want the government to go anywhere near it. And we and the government's kind of what we, we hired one of the lead advisors to the government on electoral issues, thought they could get that across the line, uh, spending a bit of political capital. The government doesn't have a lot of political, ca political capital left anymore. <laughs> um, and therefore, I think kind of big structural things that don't play to uh, kind of levelling up, um, you know, those big themes, you're not going to see happen in this administration. But I think, you, you know, you still, part of policy making is you change the ideas, you change the way people think about the system, and then you're quite kind of entrepreneurial about when you get specific, you kind of jump on specific policy and get it put into place. Are there any more online questions or should we... Oh, OK, because it's unfair on the people in the room, isn't it? We have, um, there's one here, yes. Yes, yes, you. And then there's one in the front, yeah. I have a question about uh, communication, and of course that means language, and us using hopefully some of the same terms. Um, and that would be plant-based, plant-forward, plant-centric. Uh, yes, I'm from America, but I live here in, uh, in, in London, and I was blown away by the um, number of vegetarian and vegan everywhere on menus and food products in, in the yeah. grocery stores. And um, I'm just I'm concerned that we're not people aren't using uh, plant-based in the same way. Some people think it means vegan. Some people think it means flexitarian, plant-centric, plant-forward. Tom, you mentioned eat more plants. Does that mean people who eat some meat are not doing the right thing, or some chicken, or some dairy. Um, just concerned that we're, we want to we want to communicate this so that people can think about it during breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, their next snack. And um, by the way, Fruit Loops are plant based. <laughs> so what do we do? Um, I wonder. I might give this to Neil because Neil just before this question was saying you didn't like the way things get polarized into this or that. Do you have a thought on? Well, on the meat question, it does get quite heated and it's sort of understandable that there's quite a lot of people whose livelihoods are at stake and they feel threatened. Um, but to talk about less meat in the diet is probably desirable in, in, in the UK. So, you know, you, prog you can progress. You don't have to go vegetarian or vegan. But I, I am really struck by the way that those um, meat free sections of the supermarket aisles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. As the, as the months and years go by. Frankie, do you have a preferred term out of plant-based, plant-centric, plant-forward? Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I um, have come to say plant and planet-centered <laughs> or based or, you know, I, I want to include the idea that by uh, our choices that we have a planet-wide impact. So it's a little awkward, but I'm trying it out. I totally agree that scolding people does not work invitation is what works and all the good things that a plant-centered diet can offer in terms of health and biodiversity all the things we've talked about just offering you know that that's my approach um, and that's what i use we have a question in the front row and i'm not I'm just aware that yeah each of these we've got five minutes to go so we'll get a, as many more questions in as we can we'll try and keep everything we've got front row front row here and there was somebody in the back Hi, I'm Susan Ellicott and I'm a, a cook and a journalist and a, a food writer. I have a quick round the ro round robin question for all of you. To save our health, to save biodiversity and to save the planet, what's your dream dinner that a family should have? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? Tom, we haven't heard your voice for a while. What's your dream dinner? Uh, for, to save one. planet, biodiversity, health. Yeah, yeah. Practical yeah. home cook, not an eight-course tasty mm. menu. Yeah, fair enough. Or it could just be a dream well, dish because two dishes are coming to mind. In in my book, I created one recipe called a rotation risotto, inspired by a Dan Barber's dish that he did for for an event I went to, and um, it's yeah, essentially kind of acknowledging the whole farm and the ro crop rotation of the farm. So I created a, a risotto out of spelt, rye, and clover as well, which. Um, I thought was good. I, th I wanted to mention earlier that perennials and also buckwheat is a, is, an, is a bit of a miracle crop that I think could be included in that rotation risotto because it's a brilliant cover crop that just kind of helps bring back 
nutrients to the soil naturally. Um, and then for dessert, very quickly, um, I, I had to go on uh, James Martin for COP26, and I spent ages kind of thinking about this really quirky brownie with wild mushrooms um, in it uh, <laughs> instead of flour. And um, it, it went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> But it was, it was, I wanted to talk about these two great ecosystems, our forest and the ocean. So it had seaweed and mushrooms in this brownie that did work and it did taste good. It just, mm. it just was a bit okay. too heavy for the audience. I have really quick answers because then we want to try and get two more questions than if we can. But... Any, anything with beetroot in it. Great answer. Love Thank you for the concision. Frankie. Uh, well, beans and rice. Beans and rice. Black beans and rice. Excellent answer. And there is a recipe for that in the 50th edition, isn't there? Yeah. Yes, we? beans. Beans. Bow and Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Another question here in the front row, but very quick. I just wanted to ask, um, I concur with a lot of what's been said today, but um, how come um, things that haven't been addressed, like um, the techno technological aspects of um, farming and agriculture, in particular the agriculture 4.0, and the fourth agricultural revolution, using technologies to address such problems, for instance, like uh, Internet of Things, blockchain technology, where food can be tracked and traced, and thereby improve food security and reduce wastage. I just want to know what your views are on these aspects and how they can be brought forward, and do you think they're actually, they've got some kind of credibility? This is something, I mean, for Neil, I think, if you I'll, can I'll give us brief. a fairly short answer. There's sort of two idealised worlds. There's the sustainable intensification, more technology, more knowledge, data science, uh, genetic science goes into agriculture and then there's the kind of agroecology which is think about the environmental constraints and start your agricultural system from from that basis and they're a little bit a sort of two contrasting models at the moment I think we'll probably end up with a mix of the two we had one person in the back there one person in the back there and I feel guilty if we don't go for, and I can see there's other hands up so if, <laughs> if we get your question then your question and then we'll just see what we can do in terms of answering it all in one minute <laughs> yeah, um, I think the problem with um, ultra-processed foods is that A, they're inexpensive, B, they taste great, and C, they're super easy to prepare. Um, I've seen uh, supermarkets like Waitrose, for instance, recently pairing with a Mindful Chef to create this, like, food boxes. Um, do you think there's more that supermarkets can do in a way to kind of like, encourage people with lower income to be able to create these easy dishes using sustainable vegetables? And there was a question over here, so we'll have yours as well. Right. Yeah, you can you can shout very loudly, but maybe. It was a question for Neil, really. You mentioned about the um, the petrol and the diesel being uh, stopped in uh, twenty thirty. What would be your recommendations um, from a food perspective uh, for the government to kind of to to put something in place uh, related to that? Oh. There's, there's a lot. Um, I mean, you could start with, uh, I think it would be important to look at the greenhouse gas emissions alongside water pollution and think about those two things. Don't have separate sets of civil servants operating separately on those. If you brought those two together, I think you could go a long way and it would solve a lot of the biodiversity stuff as well. So think about air, emissions to air and, and water pollution holistically. Um, that would be a good first step. And I'm going to give the very final word to Frankie to answer this question about ultra-processed foods and supermarkets. Is there something you think or believe supermarkets could do in terms of teaching people to oh, cook differently? Um, I, How would you approach you this? Well, I, mean, I don't know. What if... do you see? What do you see right there at the, at the counter as you check out? It's all of the worst food, right? So what if we had a totally different incentive system? So that you walked into a supermarket and you saw samples of dishes that made out of whole foods and and that we had a government that was making it possible for all of us to access that that at the supermarket level we could be tempted by what's good for us instead of what is destroying us and the earth so i strongly strongly believe that every sector of society uh, has to has to make this turn and uh, it is really about truly the voice of all of us in in who, who makes these decisions, in our case, you know, in Washington. And that's what I hope that, you know, all this brilliant input can weave together to empower us to do that.
Thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to, to all four of you. I could have listened for another hour and a half. Thank you so much. I'm sure you'll join me in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you so much. I had great questions from the audience. So sorry, everyone online who didn't get to answer ask a question. Um, what an amazing panel. B, you're dealing with this huge topic, this fantastic, incredibly expert panel. Um, you did it so kind of masterfully and skillfully. Thank you so much. And what a, a huge honor, um, Frankie, to have you all the way from California. Thank you for coming to join us here in London. It was my honor. I, there my were a honor. number of people who online were saying, I read Frankie's book, it changed my life. I became a vegetarian. This is amazing. So a lot of people really inspired by you. Been the most fantastic conversation. I've taken so much away from it. I love this idea that beneath the scarcity of healthy food and scarcity of healthy diets is a scarcity of democracy. And that for me is incredibly powerful as we sit here are citizens who can do things to change things in many complicated and difficult ways but how inspiring thank you everyone we have got tom's book and we've got Fr frankie's book out there uh to tom can sign frankie can't but the book is brilliant so buy it even without a signature and neil's book um, is out this summer neil's book is out this summer and it's really brilliant uh it's cracking and it just clarifies everything uh henry's book is free national food strategy national all. food strategy <laughs> that all you don't even have to pay for for it it's brilliant and important uh don't forget other food season events thank you everyone for being here and have a great night <laughs>